My name is Pastor Maria Anderson. I'm, I'm new here at St. Anne's Gar, and so it's a delight to, I came in right after the solar panels were installed. Um, so that was really kind of a neat experience for me and for our community. Um, and we're glad you're here today to hear a little bit about our journey and um, share some wisdom and um, celebrate how we use God's gifts as best as we can and most responsibly. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this time and this opportunity to be together and to figure out how to live and be good stewards of your creation. We give you thanks for the sunshine that is shining on us today and for the power that that gives us um, in our journey to be sustainable communities. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> So I'm Deb McDonough, and I've been the coordinator of this solar installation here from St. Ansgar's perspective. We also have with us today um, Jen Hatch from Revision Energy. Revision has been the contractor on this project. Uh, Ten minutes ago, I thought she was going to talk first with a little bit about solar, and then I would talk next with the financing, but we've had a request to swap that up. So I'm going to talk first about the financing. Um, when we get to the part about solar, if everybody knows that, we can skip that and go directly to questions. Um, certainly feel free to interrupt and ask questions as you have them. Um, I've got no objection to that at all. Jen, can I get you come push buttons? That would be awesome. Oh, and I should introduce Michael. Um, at the back, we have Michael, um, my son and sidekick, and he has set up the chairs for us this morning and cut all the donuts. So please help yourself to the donuts. The coffee, as I said, is hot. Help yourself there as well. And we're glad to have you with us. My story starts, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago when I went on vacation with my grandmother. Now, I don't know what happened when you went on vacation with your grandmother, but after 13 in the car, hours in the car with a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and two tiny poodles, she met me at the door and said, oh, good, you're here for the lectures. Um, so grandma vacations in Lakeside, Ohio at one of the active Chautauqua sites. The academic in residence that week was the director of the um, environmental studies program at Oberlin College. And over the course of that week, he very carefully explained to us why we couldn't keep doing what we have been doing. Um, so we came home and began a transition on our own home uh, with solar hot water, some PV panels, um, more recently a pellet boiler. And over the course of that process, have been able to reduce the carbon load of our house by about 95%. Um, which has been cool. And the decision that we made at the time was that we would take actions that would pay for themselves before the warranty went out. And that has served us very, very well over this time frame. Sort of that transition from needs to be cheaper today to needs to be cheaper over a longer period of time has been really, really productive in our thinking and something that I try to share with people as I move through. Um, it's not very long before you start looking at every roof as a potential solar site. And clearly this big south facing roof on St. Ansgar was one of our first targets. But without the tax credits, it's really tough to make a case for solar. And so we spent a long time trying to figure out what to do and if there was anything to do and carrying on with other projects. And when I came to the congregation, I was saying a couple things had changed. One thing was prices. As prices come down, the case becomes easier to make. And then the second thing was ways to make the tax incentives work even for nonprofits. And so that's what I want to walk through today. Um, so the way that we set up the project here is that our family established a limited liability corporation that's registered with the state of Maine that we called St. Ansgar Solar, for lack of a better name. And then St. Ansgar Solar has established a power purchase agreement with St. Ansgar Church to purchase the electricity from those solar panels for a period of six years. And I think we have more slides that help. So the Limited Liability Corporation can take the tax credit. Now this is a very limited corporation. The only activity of this corporation is installing those solar panels and billing for them. And so that corporation doesn't have much of a tax burden, but because the corporation is solely owned by our family, we can take that tax credit. Because it's a corporation, it's also eligible for depreciation, which hasn't been true for homeowner systems, um, but is true for business systems. 
oh, and I already said, the church buys electricity from the corporation. Now, the corporation cannot be funded by the church for legal reasons, and so in this case, what we've chosen to do is that our family was able to take a home equity loan on our house. We don't have this kind of cash to throw around and are not in a position to do that. But with that home equity loan as the funding source, we're keeping the books to pay the bill on the loan each month. The tax credits will come in. The money from the church will come in. And after this period of six years, we'll have a conversation with the church about purchasing those panels for whatever that residual financial situation might be. So, the people at Revision, you're not expected to read this, they will produce for you as many of these lovely charts detailing different ways to finance and different financing percentages and different this and that and the other thing um, to figure out what the economics of that might be. Let's do the next one where we got some of the numbers that we can actually see. Here at St. Ansgar, we put in a seven kilowatt solar array. The total installed system cost is at the top. There are some other costs involved in setting up the paperwork and establishing the LLC. That number is an estimate. I honestly can't tell you exactly what we've spent doing that. Um, and so the amount that we borrowed was the $22,000. Um, our credit union was offering some magical 2.75 rate on a five-year loan. And so, I think I need the next one. Ah, these numbers are too small as well, but I can read them out to you. The important numbers for us as a family were these numbers at the bottom as to what the corporation balance would be over each of those six years. We chose to do a five-year loan, and it turns out that for the first couple of years, the corporation, really meaning us, is in the red, that we have more money than we otherwise would have. Starting in year three, things start to get behind until you get to year six when there's a negative $8,000 balance, which means that our family will be loaning the company that money at that period of time. At the end of those six years, we'll all settle up. So the goal over time is for us not to be out anything and for the church not to be out anything over those six years. They're paying CMP's rate for that power over those six years, so nothing changes financially for them. And then at the end, we settle. Now, once I get my head locked in a space, it's difficult for me to move forward. So I didn't even ask for this next slide. Go ahead and do this next one. Until after we'd signed on our loan. So that one was a five-year loan, because it's a six-year corporation, and that seemed close, and 10 seemed too long. But when I actually had um, Sam from Revision run me this spreadsheet just a few weeks ago, you know what, I probably should have done this. My credit union was offering a 3.8% 10-year loan. And it turns out that that keeps the corporation in the black throughout that time, not impacting the family finances. The settle up amount is a little bit higher by about 1,000. So clearly, these are conversations that the congregation and the potential financers would have to have to decide how to do that. There are a lot of options. And like I said, Sam can run you through a lot of different numbers. In our case, we chose to bill them just for CMP's rate for the electricity. You could instead agree to bill for green electricity to charge a little bit more and have more money come into the corporation over those six years. Each of those changes in parameters changes this final number at the end, which is what that settle up amount might be. Um, and so it's for each organization to make a decision as to how that might best work for them and for the individuals who may be able to make that happen financially within their congregation. So what this ends up meaning is that what the congregation needs to access all these tax credits and to make the system work financially is for somebody with access to capital, not necessarily cash on hand, and enough of a tax bill to be able to take those tax credits over several years. It doesn't have to be taken all at once so that all of those financial benefits can be realized and everything can move around in such a way that things can be settled at the end. We have squirrels on our roof and they ate the wiring at one point, and so we had to pay for some netting, <coughs> mesh netting, to go around our personal solar panels to keep the squirrels from eating them again. Revision tells me this has happened like twice, and we're one of them. Um, so it's not that nothing can go wrong, it's not that nothing can happen, but there's good warranty coverage on the equipment. Um, I'm not even thinking of any problems we've had with our PV system. Um, and they've been very reliable for us. I should say, I don't work for Revision, but I am a um, 
let's just say evangelical customer <laughs> of Revision. Um, in full disclosure, they sent me some very nice chocolates for Christmas, but there's no financial game going on between us. Um, having said that, um, our family has used them for each of the projects, and we chose them for this project because they have always been very upfront and honest with us. They have talked me out of some of my kookier plans, which other companies may not have done, and have their engineering estimates. I do a lot of math. All their engineering estimates have lined up with what's actually happened with our home system. And so I've come to where I, I have confidence in the estimates that they give me. I know that there are other providers out there. If you're talking to other providers, I would encourage you to get references, make sure their systems are working the way that they say that they're working because I know that's true for some companies and not as true for others from some of my friends' experiences. And again, I'm not trying to say everybody has to buy their stuff from Revision, but just saying be careful when you talk to folks because not everybody has the experience in the engineering to do these systems properly. So this is an operations and maintenance which is a sinking fund to hang on to money if something should happen. We're not actually doing that in a formal way, but they put that in as a line item just to cover the bases. Um, this one is insurance, and in our case, when we contacted Church Mutual, who handles our insurance, they agreed to cover the corporation's insurance at no additional charge for that period of six years, but again, your mileage may vary. Um, they had put in a $70-ish charge each year for that insurance. Um, yeah, that's, yes, yes, it's something about marine equipment in the line title, which never made any sense to me, but apparently that's the right kind of insurance for the situation. Um, and then this one actually is a real expense. It's the annual uh, $80 you have to pay to the state to be a corporation. There was like $150 to start it. Um, if a church is serious about moving into the process, they're welcome to look at any number of spreadsheets and start to put things in or out. Um, initially, they had put in, um, some money for an accountant. My husband felt com comfortable doing that accounting work himself, and so we've pulled that money out. But again, depending on the individuals involved, that may be an important expense for other organizations. Um, the message is just try different scenarios and see what seems to make sense for the people involved in the particular project. So in our case, we size the system at about 90% of the church's annual usage because you can't get money by selling extra. And so if you size it exactly, you may make electricity that you just gift to CMP, which you may choose to do. Uh, we did not choose to do that. Um, the investor does need to have enough tax they would pay that taking this credit works for them. And in our family situation, what we did was two thirds of what we would need the first time, because that's how much we could sort of emotionally tackle at that moment and then came back later and installed another array of solar panels. Clearly there are cost efficiencies and getting them over only once to install everything all at once. But again, each individual in each organization is going to have a different comfort level uh, for making those decisions and there are a lot of different options as to how that could play out. So in our family case, prices were higher when we began and as prices came down and as we became more comfortable with the technology, we felt comfortable making an additional investment later. Um, by the time we were doing the church project, we already felt comfortable with the investment and we encouraged the church to do a full scale project as a first pass. Um, the other thing I should say out loud is that I personally would want to be comfortable that the church's share of this money after six years would be forthcoming. In our case, we have some money in the bank from a parsonage that we sold several years ago and the church has voted to tag some of that money for this purpose. Over six years it should be possible to have a fundraising campaign. As the financer I would want to make sure that those commitments were written down and that I felt good about them. Um, people have asked me about our liability, so what if the church shuts down before this is over? Well, we'll take our solar panels and go home. Um, there will be some expense involved in getting them taken off the roof before the building is sold, um, but we don't anticipate that happening. So this is a piece of trust between us and our congregation. Um, and again, each individual would need to make that decision based on the relationships that they've had. We've been really careful to keep 
all of the finances very transparent. Anyone is welcome to look at them at any time and to see where that money is going and where it's coming from and to be comfortable in that analysis at the end. We've chosen to set it up so that the project is paying for itself, that we are not as a family subsidizing that project. We're separating donations we might make to the congregation from this project. And our goal is to neither make nor lose money over the course of this project from start to end. Clearly there are some like we have more, they have more things that happen over the time period. But again, the church had access to all of those estimates before they agreed to move forward with the proposal. When the snow is on it, it doesn't do much, but they're so glassy smooth that the snow falls off much faster. Um, at home, we notice this mild avalanche that happens at some point after a snow, that that section clears much more um, sooner and more quickly than the rest of the roof does because it's much slipperier than those asphalt panels are and then the system's back doing what it does. Um, so, yeah. It doesn't make as much in December as it does in, say, May, which makes perfect sense. That's what the sun does around here. But the funny thing is that any given block of time, winter is actually more productive than summer because there's less haze in the air, there's less moisture in the air, um, which has just been really fun to watch and track those trends over time as well. I'm not sure I can answer that question very well. Um, we do have a contract that we signed with the church, a contract that was developed when Revision was setting up a project with the town of Scarborough. I sit on Scarborough's um, energy committee and we were able to just change line items in that contract which had been very carefully reviewed by the town's lawyers before that contract was signed. So that's where my comfort with the contract comes from. Um, and all that was done right. Um, <laughs> um, I, I honestly, I, I filled out forms on the paper the way people told me to fill out forms on the paper. I'm a geneticist, I'm not a business person, and so I needed to have people that I trusted to do that piece of the problem properly because I can't answer your question. Um, so she's asking what about several families working together to do this? Um, and I'm not entirely sure what the legal complications were. Somebody could explore that more if that was a genuine interest from an organization. It certainly seemed simpler, and um, there were less legal questions to ask when we were the only party involved and our taxes were the only ones involved. Let me just throw out there, um, I had a conversation this last week with somebody from Allen Avenue UU Church and they're in the planning process of putting together a community solar farm. And so I think the panels are gonna be located on their property, but something like nine individuals will invest in that project. It'll be separately metered. And I think he explained to me that that comes off of the investor's electricity bills somehow. So that project, as far as I understand, is not providing electricity for that church, but it would clearly be possible to set it up in a way. I mean, there are a lot of options as to how to piece together who the players are and what the financing is. Um, I'm able to speak confidently about, uh, well, almost confidently, about the process that we have used um, and would certainly encourage people to talk to the contractors. Revision is gaining quite a bit of experience in doing these interesting, convoluted ways to make it happen. Um, and so the key players in some of those other organizations may be able to answer some of those other questions. Well, it's not the tax liability thing that changes. The tax liability is exactly the same. The difference is you would need to have $22,000 in a bank account somewhere that you wouldn't miss over the period of those six years. And I don't have that. I mean, we've got one kid as a freshman in college now, the next one goes in a couple of years, other people need other things, and we don't have 22,000 spare dollars. Um, but we happen to have the money in our home equity, and we're not planning to use that at this moment in time. The other thing that we learned kind of late in the game is that at least our credit union won't let us have two home equity loans. And so this is it for us for these six, five years while well, that one is open. And so from our personal perspective, we had to make sure that we had a different backup plan, which in our case is our parents. Um, and we don't expect to need to tap that, but we wanted everybody to nod their heads and say, no, we're not gonna send you down in flames if something goes bizarre over the next couple of years. Yeah. 
It's not a rebate, so there has to be a tax bill to credit that against, but the way that corporate law seems to work is that for a wholly owned corporation like this one, there's a lot of fungibility between the personal tax bill and the corporate tax bill. And so for whatever taxes the LLC doesn't have, those tax credits roll to our families. Income tax, paperwork, now you're pushing maybe I never do the taxes. My husband always does the taxes. Um, but it pushes there in much the same way that those tax credits would have been our personal tax credits for things installed in our house. My husband has read a lot of things, and to have him here to answer some of those questions, I don't know that he holds it right here, but he um, knows where to look for that information as he sits down to do this first round of taxes, which will be significantly more complicated than the next round of taxes, when there will be exactly four payments, we're billing them quarterly, and one expense to the state, and 12 payments to the bank for the loan, and maybe a few other sundry things. But the accounting should be fairly simple in the follow-on years. In a relative way. In a relative way, yeah. Um, and certainly revision can answer a lot of questions about other aspects of how this is working. Because um, they have several different projects. Some that they've funded, but ours was too little. They have a limited tax appetite themselves and are using that tax appetite, taxes that they can take credits on for projects that are significantly larger than this seven kilowatt system that we were putting here. So, yeah, our, our heat is actually natural gas, so not there. So it's lights and computers and whatever else and that's people. The whole load? 90%, 90% is what we targeted. Um, though, we're about to replace a lot of lights with LEDs and so it might end up being closer. And um, the other thing that I don't have at my house that's new that they have here and I don't is an outlet that they can turn on and power cuts um, to plug something in and even make coffee. And I don't have that at my house. So all those solar panels on my roof do nothing. <laughs> right, yeah, I could at least have coffee um, if only I had that, but I don't. Um, so things get newer and better, but I think we're at a point where the technology is mature enough um, to seriously consider on just about any roof that aims the right way. Um, and to that end, let me just say out loud, I don't know if you've driven past that, what is it, the Days Inn, um, there at the main mall? Look out your window and you get on the highway, massive solar array on what is clearly a commercial property. Um, so the finances are there. Um, things have really changed. If you last priced stuff five or ten years ago for your house or for some other business or organization, take another look because the landscape is really, really different than it was a few years back. Um, if you've never looked at solar hot water, you should do that first because that pays back so much faster than anything else. Um, but nobody showers here. Um, so, well, not very often. Um, so, yeah, if you have places you need to be, feel free to go. Jen has a few slides to run through on, like, how you think about whether your roof is any good for solar or not, or other sorts of things about solar more generally. Um, and clearly, Revision is available to answer any of those questions. And I can stick around and ask other sorts of questions, answer other sorts of questions as they come up. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief overview of solar energy. Uh, as mentioned, I, I work for Revision Energy. I, I work in the office, I, I've been there for about eight years now, so I've done a little bit of everything, but I'm, I'm not an expert in the, in the financials or, anything, or, or in the, the technology, but I have a basic understanding of it all. But um, So one of the questions we get quite often is, does solar work in Maine? And uh, so, because we do have a lot of snow and we, in, uh, in a long winter, and it does, and uh, you might have noticed the panels are clear here on the roof, so as Deb mentioned, they do, when the snow is on them, we don't, uh, they don't get a lot of production, but they do slide off, snow slides off quite nicely, much like a metal roof would. Um, so, and we do get good sunlight here in Maine. It's, uh, it's, it's better than, actually, when we look at the insulation value of the amount of sunlight that we get here in Maine, Germany is the world ca uh, leader in solar installations, and we get about 30% more sun than, than they do. So we have, we have the resource uh, where we don't, where we sort of lack in Maine a bit is the um, the incentives, um, you know, but we but where the prices come down in solar electric panels, 
and the and the federal rebate still a uh, federal tax credit rather still available. The price is really good, and as as also the price of electricity continues to rise, you can really make a good argument, a strong ar argument for solar electricity. Yep, and our price, as probably all of you have heard, the prices uh, on your CMP bill is going to rise this spring and likely to rise again. So. This is, uh, as Deb mentioned, this is a way to protect yourself from long-term energy costs. It's not looking at a, a quick fix, but looking at the long-term and uh, stable energy prices and clean energy. Uh, so we're looking at solar as just a clean, stable fuel source. This is in uh, Waterville, Maine, Oakhurst Dairy. Uh, they also, in their, on their Portland location, have solar hot water. So they've done some, some work to be sustainable. So just want to talk about the fundamentals of solar. When we do look at a, at a roof, we're looking at primarily three things. One is shade, that's the biggest thing. This is what's called the solar pathfinder. So the solar pathfinder will look at uh, trees, chimneys, nearby houses, et cetera, that might pose shade on the panels any time of the day throughout the year. So we do want a solar window that is from nine to three. That's our ideal. A little bit shorter than that is okay, but too short and you're, you're just um, reducing efficiency. So we want clear, um, open space for the panels. Just talked about that. And then if it's new construction, just considering future growth of trees. The collector tilt, that's actually a little less important. We are at 45 degree latitude here. So 45 degree angle of your panel will give you the best year round sun throughout the course of the, of the year. Uh, if you have a flatter pitch, you'll get better summer sun, steeper pitch, better winter sun. So sort of in between, these panels are fixed arrays. So you set them and forget them. They just, they go up and they don't move. Um, there are some panels that can move track with the sun. Uh, most of them are just gonna be a fixed array. So we're looking for, um, you know, so we're really just going to be installing on whatever pitch roof there is. It's, it, there's, it's a little bit less important than the, um, than the clearing and the orientation. So we want the panels to be facing south. And solar south is 196 degrees. You can be within 45 degrees to either side of that and still perform with 45, uh, with 90% or better efficiency, rather. So there is a little bit, a little bit of wiggle room. And if you're even further outside of that, um, that window, you could compensate by adding a couple extra panels to get the performance that you want. We do use a tool, it's an online tool called PV Watts, and you can put in different size arrays and play around with the tilt and the orientation and see how that affects your production. So, um, and then the other piece to that would be the shading analysis that we would add to get the real vision of what the system will produce. So that's kind of what we look at uh, when looking at a, at a house. And, uh, and I should mention, um, most, uh, your, your first option is, like, is gonna be your roof for a solar array. If that is not a viable option, it can be a ground, uh, be placed on a ground. We've even, even done them on sides of houses before, like an awning mount. And now we are in the um, starting a new phase, uh, which is called a solar farm, where you can buy into an array that lives in a remote location. So if you just don't even want panels on your roof, or you just you don't have a good site for it, or you don't own a home, or you're a condo owner, or what have you, um, that is an option that you can buy into a system. It's like it's on your roof, except it's living somewhere else. So that's new, very new to us, and uh, something that will be developing in the next year or two. Yes. Does, does community solar make more sense for hot water than for solar? It does not actually, uh, because the community, the it only works for the photovoltaics. Actually, the with solar hot water, uh, it's it, this is best often on your roof and actually very close to where your tank is. Um, the solar hot water systems. So we do two types of systems: solar hot water, solar electricity. I'm just going to briefly. Uh, touch on the solar hot water. Advertising, they never talk about it on the news. It's a mature technology. It's like um, plumbing and thermos bottles 
and there's just nothing to say about it in the news, yeah. and it's the first thing you should usually do in an application, and nobody knows about that. So we know you're here to hear about the PD yeah. for most of these settings, but I made her keep just two slides in because it's really important. We're well, talking about energy savings. Um, if you have an oil boiler heating your hot water in the summer months, you should consider solar hot water because you are burning probably two or three hundred gallons a year just on your domestic hot water alone. So. Uh, solar hot water system, how that works is you have, I think, um, explain here. These represent the collectors on the roof, uh, and then this will represent the tank in your basement. So this is an indirect hot water tank, much like any other indirect hot water tank, except there's two internal heat coils instead of one. Uh, this is your boiler. So what you have up here in your collectors is not water, but it's glycol. It's a glycol mix. So it's an antifreeze system. So that gets hot up in your collector. It's going to travel down through the heat coils, indirectly heating the water in your tank, and go back up again to get hot. This is a closed loop system. And as long as the solar panels are able to heat the tank sufficiently, your boiler will stay off. So the system is designed to heat the tank May through October, 100%. So the real benefit is to allow your boiler to stay off during the summer months. Whenever the solar is not able to heat the tank sufficiently to its set point temperature, the backup boiler is still there to come on. So you're never without hot water. These systems, I should say, are always backed up by something. So they're meant to reduce your energy loads, but not, re not replace your need for energy altogether. Um, and then in the winter months, these act more as a preheat, so you're going to get your hot water tank up to 70, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the boiler comes on to do the rest. Whoops, but your boiler's already on for heat, so it's less waste. It's that on-off hot cycling that we want to prevent. Yeah. The hot water panels are 80 to 100 pounds. Uh, the electric panels are roughly 30 pounds, so not that heavy. They add, the electric panels add about three pounds per square foot of, on the roof. So it's really like an extra layer of shingles. It's not a structural issue in most cases. All right, so that's uh, just, a, just a touch on hot water. And there are flyers in the back if you're interested in those. And just, uh, again, the 30% tax credit. So the tax credit's good through 2016. That's important to note because it's... You know, that's not that far away. Um, a hot water system is between eleven dollars to $12,000. And the payback, it really depends on the energy that you're offsetting. But four to six years, Deb, was, yours was probably quicker because you got a state rebate at the time. Or? Yeah, that was the other thing. Like, oh, you I didn't? About, I think ours was five or six. Yeah. I stopped doing that math after yeah. a while. Yeah. <laughs> like, so whatever. Yeah. yeah. And we kept shifting the, yeah. the lines. Yeah, that's true. Months. And then after, you know, the real beautiful thing is that after that it's free. So, you know, for the, these systems will last 20 to 30 years with little to no maintenance involved uh, on them. Yeah. Yeah, they're really meant to be uh, hands off, uh, you know, not necessarily totally maintenance free. The hot water systems, we do recommend a service every three to five years. It is a temperature controlled, pressurized uh, system. Um, but the hot water systems, that's like a 30-year lifespan, and for the electric, it's actually longer. Um, so I'll get a bit into the solar electricity, uh, which is what the church has, solar electric panels. We call this grid-tied photovoltaics. Grid-tied meaning you're tied into the grid, CMP. Photovoltaic uh, solar electricity. So we, kinda, we sometimes abbreviate that for PV. So you might say uh, grid-tied PV or just PV. Uh, this is in... Belfast, I believe. It's a passive house, uh, which is barely using any energy, and they're offsetting the energy that they use with solar panels. So really, there's a lot of really cool construction happening here in Maine. Um, so kind of rules of thumb, PV rules of thumb, one kilowatt of PV is 1,000 watts. One kilowatt is going to roughly produce 1,200 kilowatt hours of electricity um, a year, so one kilowatt equals roughly 100 kilowatt hours a month on, off of your electric bill. So if you look at your electric bill and see what your annual average is, but your monthly average rather, and one kilowatt is going to roughly cost you $3,500. So um, where these are grid connected, um, you have the panels on the roof, 
when the sun is hitting them, they're making direct current electricity. Your house is using alternate current, or your building, this building. So you have what's called the inverter, which uh, in here is just in the other room, and we can look at that afterwards. The inverter is going to convert the electricity that the panels make into electricity that your uh, building can use. And it's going to feed the electric loads um, at the time that you're using them. So right now, the electricity that's being produced is likely coming from the solar panels. Um, if it were a really cloudy day or there's snow was covering the solar panels, then the electricity that we'd be using would be coming probably from CMP. Or night. Or night, <laughs> yes, at night time. Uh, if the church was closed down and no one was here, the excess, the electricity that was being produced would feed back out into the grid and the church would get a credit. So it's this continuous give take with the grid. You're either taking from CMP or you're giving to CMP or you're using the electricity in real time. At the end of the month, um, CMP is gonna look to see how much electricity did you take, how much did you give, and you'll get a bill or a credit for that. And uh, the credits can carry forward for up to 12 months on a bill. After 12 months, they go away. So there is no incentive to have a system that is gonna just make way more than you're able to use over the course of the year. So it's important that we look at the annual average of a house and expected load differences. If you're gonna add to your load, decrease. You know, We always try to do a little bit less than you're actually using in the course of the year to give space for conservation measures and stuff like that, so. So in Maine, it's just this, it is a one for one kilowatt hour. So you're not paying distribution out, you're not paying distribution in, but if you net purchased 100 kilowatt hours, you will pay for 100 kilowatt hours. And it took me 45 minutes to read the first bill, but they have a nice packet that they sent to mail that explains how to read your bill. <laughs> and it's right, it's just really confusing. So your distribution cost goes away, you just pay for the kilowatt hours? Well, you pay distribution and kilowatt hours for any of this net. So it's as if the building, like if your building usually uses 500 kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. and your system makes 400 kilowatt hours, you'll pay for 100 kilowatt hours exactly as if your bill was for 100 kilowatt hours. So you'll pay your service fee, you'll pay your generation fee, you'll pay your distribution fee for that 100 kilowatt hours, whatever that would have been, but the rest just comes and goes away. And does, is the same true for credit? If you, if you produce more than you need, you get a credit on the distribution as well? Well, you get, yes. What you get is a kilowatt credit. Yeah. So your credit reads, like our bill once read 127 kilowatts credit. And so the first 127 kilowatts you use the next month, you don't pay anything at all. And then they start right. doing exactly what they had to do. Because so the distribution cost is almost half of it. Yes. Huge. Yes. And so you're not paying for the solar generated electricity. You're not paying distribution and you're not paying mm -hmm. generation. So that's the number you need to be looking at when you're thinking about the financing mm -hmm. um, is both of those pieces. And so when we're billing the church, we're looking at both of those pieces, looking at the church's bill and the church's rates, whatever those are, mm -hmm. and doing the math that way. Okay, thank you. About the inverter, so the one, you know, the main function is to take the electricity from the panels into the load center. Uh, the other function that it that holds is that it's reading the frequency of the grid, the utility grid, on a continuous basis. So utility grid ever should go down, um, then the inverter will turn itself off. And that's a safety feature so that you can't put live electricity back out into, um, into the line. If when, as soon as the grid goes back up again, then the inverter turns itself back on. So, that's a, so these are not meant to provide you with power during a power outage, but rather reduce the amount of energy that you take in from the grid. So then you can't, you can't switch. Um, so there's a picture of the inverter, which we can go look at and see. Um, the grid replaces the battery. So, right, instead of having a battery bank, we have the utility grid that's holding on to the excess electricity that the panels make. So see, we, we help you apply for uh, the interconnection application. That gives you your, in most cases, a second meter. So you'll have it, are there two meters another, here? Yeah, there's two meters here. So one-time application fee, yep. Yeah. 
for that interconnection application, then they come and they install that second meter. So that's how they can track the backflow electricity, what's going back out into the grid. They're pretty, they're pretty easy to work with on that. Um, there's different options for roof mounting. Uh, to the top left, that's on, you know, on a garage, asphalt shingle. Top right, that's in Falmouth, that's on a boathouse. So just showing, like th these panels don't necessarily need to be on a main house. They don't necessarily even need to be near the house. They can be quite a ways away. And then the front and center uh, standing seam metal roof. So in that case, we would clamp the panels on so not to make roof penetrations. Um, the panels are on railing, which I think I do have some pictures of. Oh, before we get to that though, uh, again, if you, if you can't have the system on your roof, if that's not a good option, you could do it on the ground. So uh, pole mount systems to the left, they're a little sizable as you can see with the people in there. Um, and then to the right, a, ground, a custom made ground mount system. So there's really no uh, limit to how the panels can be configured, how many you have. You can, your limit will be, um, you know, this, this limit of your system is gonna be how much electricity do you use, how much space do you have for panels, and, or how much do you wanna spend. So, um, but we can work within those ranges. And then the uh, other piece is a tracking system, as I mentioned. So this is using, GPS technology, the trackers come from a company out of Vermont, All Sun, and this is in Norway, Maine, one of our clients. He's posing with his electric car, it's just not really charging from that tracker directly, but. Um, <laughs> uh, so those are, they're quite sizable, but they're really cool. They move every like six minutes, you know, following the sun, up and down. They, they put themselves to sleep at night, um, by laying flat. They also are reading the wind with an anemometer and it, once it reaches, I forget exactly what mile per hour, again, they'll put themselves to sleep. If you ever want to see some trackers, uh, we just installed six at the main Audubon in Falmouth. So if you just drive down the Audubon Road, you'll see right on the right hand side a whole a little field of trackers and they're going to be doing an open house in uh, April, I think. So. And two directional trackers add like 25% production typically? 40. Whenever? Mm -hmm. okay. yep. yeah. And what does that add to the installation cost? They're expensive. <laughs> um, a tracker itself, they only come in two sizes, and the trackers are about 35,000 installed cost, giving you around 700 kilowatt hours of electricity a month, seven to 800. So you also have to have the energy load to offset it. Um, they really work best if you have a field that you could place it in, because they are, they're pretty chunky. So you, you wouldn't want them in your front lawn, <laughs> I don't think, anyway. 30% um, tax credits. A typical size system might be four kilowatts. That would give you, on average, 400 kilowatt hours a month. Cost around 14,000 to install. You get the tax credit, so your net cost comes down to 9,000. These systems are expected to last 40 plus years. The panels carry a 25 year performance warranty. Um, so 25 years after they're installed, they're expected to perform at 80% efficiency. So really long lasting with, again, no maintenance that we expect. The inverter might need to be replaced uh, once within the life of the panels. And beyond that, that's really it. And just in terms of payback for the church of system, that should be producing on the order of $1,500 with electricity a year with that nine or $10,000 residual. We're looking at eight to 10 years, depending on exactly how that all plays out, mm -hmm. um, beyond the six years. So with, with all of the financing costs and all of the LLC costs and all of the whatever the other costs are. Um, I'll just sit down so you can see these. This is uh, the Freeport Community Library. They do the 10 kilowatt system. This just shows the railing. So we first put down railing and then the panels on top of it. So there's actually about an inch between your roof and the panel. Uh, this helps to, uh, it makes less penetration for one and then also it uh, allows some airflow to go between the roof and the panel. They, panels work a little better w when they're cooler. Uh, so that's just another putting down the panels. We have a team of installers, so we, we're a full service installation company. We do everything from the design to installation. Our installers, once the job is designed and sold, uh, we then send out a team of four to five people. They go out there, 
Uh, typically, an installation is done within two days. This is the church here. So this was in the preliminary design phase. Uh, we were looking at, uh, you know, we're facing south. The panels are facing south. Where is the um, inverter going to go? This, so it's a seven kilowatt system, as mentioned. There's a 6,000 watt inverter, which we'll go look at. This is part of the installation here on the church. Another one. We did it. When was this? In the fall? It looks November. like November. Yeah. Must have been warm weather. <laughs> T-shirts. Uh, here, you know, where these panels will last for 40 or more years, it's very likely they will out. They're going to outlast asphalt shingle roofing. So, in 20 years or so, they might. We might, you know, take down the panels, redo the roof, put them back up again. So, um, that's another piece of it. Standing seam metal roof, if you're building new and have the option, you know, standing seam metal roof will last typically the same lifespan as the panels. So that's a nice complement to them. But and this is in there we can go take a look at. And I think that is it. So I <laughs> photogenic family in New Hampshire. <laughs> Um, do we want to take a look at the inverter? Yes. And I, I'm going to be around for questions. Um, but if people want to take a look at the inverter, you can follow Deb. Um, oh, going into the boiler room is where we're going, where the electrical panels are. Um, maybe I'll start. I'll get this way. Yeah, so the light's behind. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that first and then this. Okay. So this is all of the existing electrical panel that the church already had. This is the piece that was added for the solar installation. The larger box is the inverter that converts the DC electricity to the AC electricity that the building can use. This is an extra meter that's just for building purposes. It's not part of a standard installation. And then here's the fancy switch that gives you one outlet, even in a blackout. Um, and all the instructions. Really, that's all that they've added inside of the building. There is a single wall penetration. Okay, let's try again. There's a single wall penetration uh, up at that square box with the red tag on it. Um, oh, out to the conduit that runs around the outside of the building and up to the roof. Uh, very inconspicuously. Go look for it if you'd like. Um, huh, so that comes around so, up here. So that's this conduit. Coming so down. conduit connecting it to the electrical box. Oh, I and see. And there's conduit connecting it to the outside world. And there are no, there's nothing else inside the building that has changed. Okay. And then so, the, the reading on that um, window there? I think you knock on this one. I knock on mine to make it light up. No, I don't knock on this one to make it light up. That's really dark. So that says that it's making 5,700 watts right now. That says that it's made 11 kilowatt hours so far this morning. And it says it's made 1,180 kilowatt hours since the second of